continuing our discussion about Taylor polynomials, now we're going to move on and we're going to talk about how these polynomials could be an exact a substitution for our function. In other words, how could we come up with a Taylor polynomial that was equal to our function, not just an approximation of our function. Everything that we've talked about so far has been this finite Taylor polynomial that has n terms, and we stop wherever we are told to up to this point, but this just approximates what our function is doing. So the nth Taylor polynomial, or Maclaurin, if we're built around zero, approximates the output of the function near some value x that we've built around. Well, if we had a remainder term, this is the difference, this remainder term is the difference between our Taylor polynomial, our nth degree Taylor polynomial, if we add that to, then that is going to equal our function on some interval of x very near our point of tangency. So this plus the remainder equals the function. So this is what we're going to concentrate on in the next couple of lessons, the whole idea of the remainder. The remainder is how we are going to determine the error or the difference between the outputs of the polynomial and the outputs of the function because that's what it's going to be. It's going to be an over approximation or an under approximation. And so let's talk about what that's going to look like and what it's called. This is called the Lagrange form of the remainder. It's also called the Lagrange error bound. The Lagrange error bound. It's how much can the error be? What is the maximum error between our polynomial with n terms and our function? So again, we're concentrating on the difference between our approximating polynomials and our function so that we can get an equivalent to the function. So this is the remainder of order n. It looks just like the next term in the series. If I was generating f of n at a over n factorial times x minus a to the n, there's our nth term in p sub n of x, right? We saw that in the last set of lessons. Well, if we carry this on, then f of n plus 1 is simply the next derivative. If this is the sixth derivative, then that would be the seventh derivative. We'll talk about c in a minute, but I want you to see that the other elements are the same. If this is the sixth factorial, this would be the seventh factorial on our linear term raised to a power, if this is the power of 6, this is going to be the power of 7. So basically what it looks like, what it is, and how we come up with it, is we generate the next term for the polynomial. So it's not difficult to come up with the error bound. What is different about it is the fact that we're not going to evaluate it at A. A has been replaced by C. And there is a relationship between A, X, and C. We're now going to be looking at an interval 
and we're going to be looking where this gives the max or most error. The error bound is what is the most the error could be. So generating the Lagrange form for the error bound or Lagrange form of the remainder is not difficult. It's the next term in the polynomial. And we've had lots of practice at that. Determining what value you plug into that to see what your maximum error is, is where you've got to do a little more thinking, a little more involved in that. The absolute value of the Lagrange error bound is called the error associated with the approximation. Now, we want to use the absolute value because we don't care if the error is an over approximation or an under approximation. And so just by finding the absolute value of it, we don't have to worry about whether p sub n of x plus r sub n of x equals f of x versus p sub n of x minus r sub n of x equals f of x. In other words, is this an under approximation so that I have to add the remainder term or is this an over approximation so that I have to subtract the error term? If we just get the magnitude of the error, we don't worry about whether it's positive or negative, that's all we're going to be interested in. And the magnitude of the error, whether over approximation or under approximation, is simply the absolute value of the difference in the output of those two functions at any given value x. That's all that means. It allows us to determine the accuracy of our approximation. So it tells us within what value, maybe how many decimal places, within what fraction, that our polynomial is approximating our function. And in the last lesson, we did that. We actually got our calculators out and we found the difference between the output of the function very near our tangent point and the output of the approximating polynomial. Well, now we're going to find an error bound. Instead of having a calculator and finding exactly what the error is, we're going to find what is the most that the error could be. And if that is within an acceptable bound for us, then we're all good. Now, a note on notation. Here is an example. It says, find a formula for r sub 6 of x, the remainder for the Taylor polynomial of order 6 based at a, then obtain a good bound for r sub 6 of 0.5, and here's our function, f of x equals the natural log of the quantity 2 plus x, and we're centered at 0. So the first thing we need to do is build p sub 6 of x. So let's go about doing that. We need f of x, which we're given. We need f prime of x, 1 over 2 plus x, again, in this context, that's going to make it easier for me to find subsequent derivatives. Negative 2 plus x to the negative 2. There is no chain rule here. The derivative of what's inside is 1. Third derivative, positive 2, 2 plus x to the negative 3. Fourth derivative, negative 6 times quantity 2 plus x to the negative 4. Fifth derivative, positive 24 times 2 plus x to the negative 5. Now, will the first five derivatives give me the polynomial of order 6? 
No, it won't. I've got to have the sixth derivative as well. Here is going to give me order six. That should be negative 120 to the negative six. So there's my derivatives. The next thing I do is evaluate all those derivatives and my function at zero. F double prime of zero, F triple prime of zero, fourth derivative at zero, fifth derivative at zero, and sixth derivative at zero. Now just to clarify, this didn't say find the first six terms or find the first seven non-zero terms. This told me the order to which to build my polynomial. So if any of these coefficients go to zero, that's fine. I don't have to add another term. It didn't ask for the first so many non-zero terms. So the words matter when you're told to do this work. So be careful and think about that. So if I plug zero into my function, I get the natural log of two plus zero. So that's the natural log of two. If I plug zero into f prime, I get one over two plus zero, that's one half. If I plug into f double prime, I get negative one, hopefully you can follow me here, over the quantity two plus zero squared. So that's negative one fourth. For the third derivative, I get positive two over 2 cubed. Are we all right with that? That simplifies. I get negative 6 over 2 to the fourth, which will also simplify. Now I get 24 over 2 to the fifth. Let's see, 12 sixteenths and 3 fourths. Hope that's right. And then I get 120 over 64. So let's see, 15 eighths, hopefully that's right. So there, in my form of f to the n at a over n factorial x minus a to the n, I'm centered at zero. But now I have figured out this part of all those terms. So let's go back over here. And I'm going to erase this, give myself some room. And now let's build our polynomial. P sub 6 of x equals f of a, natural log of 2, plus f prime of a times x minus a plus, which is going to be minus, that over 2 factorial, right, times x minus 0 quantity squared. The next one is plus 1 fourth over 3 factorial. I'll speed up here, x cubed minus 3 eighths over 4 factorial x to the fourth plus 3 fourths over 5 factorial x to the fifth plus 15 eighths over 6 factorial x to the sixth. So there's our polynomial, but frankly all it's asking for is it's asking for the remainder. So now that we have it built, I'm at the end of this video. We'll pick up here in the next video, so look for that.